Good afternoon. We would like to acknowledge that the land Getty inhabits today was once known as Tavangar, the home of the Gabrieleno Tongva people. We show our respects to the Gabrieleno Tongva people as well as all First People, past, present, and future, and honor their labor as original caretakers of this land. Getty commits to building relationships with the Gabrieleno Tongva community and we invite you to acknowledge the history of this land and join us in caring for it. My name is Greg Sandoval. I am a Senior Public Program Specialist here at the J. Paul Getty Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Unpacking Camille Claudel, Curators in Conversation. This program complements the current and magnificent exhibition, Camille Claudel, which opened today and is on view in the Special Exhibitions Pavilion on the second floor. The show today will be open until 5.30 p.m., but the show will be on view through July 21st, so you have plenty of time to bring people back to see um, this wonderful convening of these works. It's great. This exhibition was co-organized by the J. Paul Getty Museum and the Art Institute of Chicago. The presentation in Los Angeles is gener generously supported by Anissa and Paul John Balsam II in honor of Paul M. Balsam, MD. We have also been generously sponsored by City National Bank. Our exhibition cultural par partners include the um, General Consulate of France here in Los Angeles and v Villa Albertine here in Los Angeles. Before I introduce our guests, just a quick few notes. Uh, for he, all of you here in the lecture hall, please take a moment to silence your phones. And for our online in attendees, closed captioning has been enabled. To access live captioning, click the CC icon on the Zoom menu bar at the bottom of the screen. And time permitting, we, will be able, we may be able to take some questions. For online audience, please use the Q&A function on your Zoom menu bar, and for those here in the auditorium, there will be a couple of mics coming down the aisles, so please wait until you have a mic in your hand before you ask your question. And now I would like to turn the program over to Annalise Dema, Senior Curator of Sculpture and Decorative Arts here at the Getty. Thank you very much, Greg, and uh, I'm of course pleased to see this uh, lecture hall full, and I know that there are also many people attending on the Zoom, so I think on behalf of everyone on this stage, we are truly very pleased. So it's a very special moment for me because I have two uh, very uh, delightful guests to introduce to, uh, to you. Cécile Bertrand, who flew from uh, Paris on Sunday to be with us. She's the director of the uh, uh, Musée uh, Camille uh, Claudel and my dear colleague and friend Emerson Boyer, who is Searle Curator in the Depart Department of Painting and Sculpture of Europe at the Art Institute of Chicago. And as Greg explained, it was a, a partnership with uh, that institution and uh, the Getty. And uh, with the exhibition actually having the first venue in Chicago between October and February, and as you've just heard, and I hope you've already seen the exhibition, it opened to the public uh, this, um, this morning. So uh, we've uh, planned for a very hopefully delightful conversation between the, the three of us to give you a little bit some behind the scenes uh, insights or to explain to you why some of the artworks couldn't travel to the uh, exhibition. So uh, it's a little bit rude, but I will not give the mic right away to my guests. I just wanted perhaps to give you a very uh, short introduction because you might wonder, well, how did all this uh, idea of an exhibition on Camille Claudel started? Uh, it was actually shortly after the Getty Museum acquired this uh, bronze, a fantastic uh, artwork, I hope you all agree. Um, we met, uh, I think, just a few months later, Emerson and myself, in London, uh, and as we do, uh, you know, among curators, we meet uh, during uh, other exhibitions, art fairs, and we we have then the opportunity of you know sharing ideas and developing uh, projects. And it's how we both decided that uh, it could be a great idea to organize an exhibition on this fantastic uh, woman sculptor. 
because indeed in the United States, uh, American audiences do not have very often the opportunity to admire her artworks. I'm showing you on the screen the artworks um, that were in, still are actually, in uh, American museums until 2018, so you see it's not many. And uh, since uh, 2018, of the three were acquired, uh, including actually uh, the museum uh, uh, in which um, Emerson works, uh, the Art Institute of uh, Chicago. But as you can see, it's less than 10 artworks, so uh, our visitors uh, do not uh, see her artworks, except when they have a chance to travel to France, but that's not a given for everyone. Um, uh, so, if you've not encountered her artworks in American museums, perhaps some of you, uh, you may know her name thanks to uh, movies, and you know, we are close to Hollywood. So here at the Getty, we always try to have this kind of little, you know, connection with, uh, with the movie world. And um, so some of you might have seen this uh, quite fantastic uh, movie on uh, Camille Claudel, which I must say uh, was quite well researched in the way you are showed in this movie uh, all the, the work that goes in an atelier of a sculptor, but it's still a movie uh, which a little bit insists on the, um, you know, uh, the passion between these two fantastic sculptors, Auguste Rodin and uh, Camille Claudel. And then another uh, movie was done on another dramatic aspect of her life, uh, which is, un you know, unfortunately her uh, health issues and the fact that she was, uh, you know, uh, committed to a, a psychiatric institution uh, from uh, 1913 uh, until um, she died in 1943. A beautiful movie uh, with uh, Juliette Binoche as an actress, but nothing to do with her history because uh, this is after um, she was interned and she uh, stopped sculpting. Uh, after she's, that time. She's done pretty well for herself, right? I yeah. Mean, <laughs> Isabella Diani, Julia Pinoche. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's, you know, the best uh, French actresses you can, uh, you can have to, uh, to embody uh, this uh, amazing, uh, amazing woman. Yes, good point. Um, uh, so uh, we must anyway um, uh, remind everyone that uh, there have been uh, some exhibitions on Camille Claudel in the United States, but uh, quite a long time ago. The first one uh, was uh, actually in Washington DC in 1988, organized by the grand niece of Camille Claudel, Reine Marie Paris. And then there was another one uh, with a venue in Detroit in 2005. And, uh, so while the first one was really devoted entirely and exclusively to Camille Claudel, with only a handful of artworks by Rodin, the second one was, uh, you know, um, uh, trying to re-explore the uh, fantastic artistic collaboration of these two uh, great uh, geniuses uh, in the art of uh, sculpture. So, as you can see, it was about time to, uh, you know, to do something in the United States for our, our, our public. Uh, instead, in contrast, in France, Camille Claudel has been uh, present uh, quite massively, I would say, in French institutions from already her lifetime. And uh, you can see on the left uh, the bust that was the first artwork that entered a French uh, museum, the portrait of her uh, sister, which was acquired by Charlotte de Rothschild, who gave this artwork to the uh, city of Clermont-Ferrand, where it has been on public view since uh, 1887. And there are other artworks um, very uh, early on uh, bought by the cousin of Charlotte, Alphonse, and given to French museums. So just to give you this example, Camille Claudel is also uh, present in major uh, art museums in the capital, including, of course, some of her masterpieces being at the Musée d'Orsay. And she has also a gallery entirely devoted to her at the Musée Rodin, actually something that was planned by Auguste Rodin himself when he was planning for the donation of all uh, his belongings and his mansion to the French uh, state. And more recently, uh, France has even uh, decided to uh, name a museum after uh, Camille Claudel, and so that was just my short introduction, because of course, speaking of the Musée Camille Claudel, I have the best guest ever you can imagine to speak about this institution. It was my great pleasure to meet uh, with uh, Cécile I think it was just shortly before the pandemic started. I was on a, a research uh, trip with one of my colleagues, uh, a senior conservator here at the Getty. We were working on uh, an upcoming publication of a French uh, uh, 
the French sculpture uh, catalog of, uh, of the Getty, and we were, uh, you know, uh, willing to examine a b uh, an artwork that is in uh, in this uh, collection, this beautiful crouching woman in uh, in a plaster, which is the preliminary step before uh, the bronze that the Getty um, acquired. So. Cecil, would you mind telling us a little bit more about uh, your institution? Yes, thank you. Um, Nogent-sur-Seine Museum is uh, both very young and quite ancient. It was created in its first version in 1902 by Alfred Boucher, who was a sculptor and Camille Claudel's first teacher. Thanks to him, we keep a large collection of, ninth century, of 19th century French sculpture, which is still one main strength of the museum today. And you see here um, an old photograph of the first museum and an actual photograph, a recent photograph. 15 years ago, the museum made a new start. The city of Nogent-sur-Seine, which owns and runs the museum, decided to transform the small, old-fashioned Dubois Boucher Museum into a large, modern Camille Claudel Museum. To understand this decision, you need to remember that Camille Claudel used to live in Nogent-sur-Seine as a teenager. She modeled her first sculptures in the house which you see on the, on the left uh, in the photograph, and she met Alfred Boucher as well, her first teacher in Nogent-sur-Seine. And in 2008, this very house was booked to be part of the future museum. And in the same year, the museum acquired a large private collection of works by Camille Claudel from Reine Marie Paris, the great niece. Camille Claudel's great niece, who played a key role in the rediscovery of the artist. And here you see some of the works which were booked from her. A new museum project was launched, and a new building was designed by the architect Adelpho Scaranello. He included the Claudel familial house and added contemporary brick volumes. Brick because it is made of clay, the material of sculpture. And as you see, it is as well a material of local architecture. The museum changed its name, and the Camille Claudel Museum opened in, 19, in 2017. And since 2008, Camille Claudel has been a main direction of our acquisition policy, and nowadays we display about 45 sculptures by the artist. They constitute the five last rooms of the visit, mainly in Claudel's familial house. And these five rooms find echoes in the other museum's rooms, so the first part of the visit does not only give an overview of French sculpture around, 19, around 1900, but also presents the context of Camille Claudel's career. For instance, this room on the photograph is devoted to edition sculpture. It shows how famous sculptures were multiplicated in different sizes by bronze and ceramic producers. And further, visitors discover bronze casts of Claudel's works by Eugène Blot. The commercial process is similar, but Blot used to work with a few chosen artists only and organized exhibitions to promote them. And now I want to give you an overview of our Camille Claudel's department. Uh, here you see the first room, which is dedicated to the beginning of her career. Alfred Boucher's teaching and influence, and then her productive artistic exchanges with Auguste Rodin, 
during the period they shared their personal life and the same studio. Head of a slave and man with arms crossed are very close to figures made by Rodin for the gates of hell at the same time. We show works by both artists side by side to explain the mutual influence and how each, other, each of them developed his and her art, stimulated by the gaze of the other. For instance, you can compare both coaching women or see how both represented entwined bodies as expression of passionate love. However, you see that the relationship between the lovers is very different. Next room is dedicated to Camille Claudel's portraits, from the youth works to the last ones. For instance, the Renaissance-inspired portrait of her brother as a young Roman, almost as beautiful as <laughs> Emerson's one in Chicago. And on the right, a bust of a gigantic, also named head of a brigand. Here, a plaster of the little lady and an evolution of this child portrait as the goddess Aurora, very Art Nouveau with her hair curve around the face. Next is a room devoted to the waltz, which echoes with a room dedicated to movement previously in the visit, and notably to the dance, with sculptures by Antoine Bourdel, Alfred Boucher, and in the showcase, representations of Louis Fuller. You see how Claudel is skilled at representing movement, and the waltz is the climax of this research. Everything contributes to the effect of movement. The composition along a diagonal axis, the unsteady position, the distorted bodies, especially the back of the man, and the drapery, evoking the swirling movement of the waltz. Afterwards, you are arriving in the room of age of maturity, where you can see works about youth and old age. And to these themes belong two recent acquisitions. The God Has Flown Away, a first version of the Implorer, and Hand and Head of an old blind man singing, which is small but very impressive. Especially the open mouth, which almost evokes a scream rather than a song, and this amazing blind gaze. One more room, the last one, where you can see Claudel's last creation period, the works she made after separating from Rodin in her personal life. She was obviously making a conscious effort to reinvent her style, to distance it from Rodin and to prove her independence as an artist. To achieve this, she sometimes drew inspiration from Japanese art, especially in the chatterboxes with the screen. The bodies are highly expressive, although the group is tiny. Just seeing their back, you can feel how carefully they are listening to the friend. And at the same time, and at the same time as this miniature sketches from nature, Claudel created the most monumental sculpture of her career, Perseus and the Gorgon, which you see in the back, and that we will discuss more in detail later. Thank you, Cécile. So, you selected great images, but I think Emerson and I need to emphasize that this museum is really a, you know, a jewel in terms of museum to discover so many 19th century uh, artists. So, not only Camille Claudel, but Boucher and Dubois. 
It's only one hour away from Paris, not even. Very easy, you take the train from the Gare de l'Est, you cross the river, it's a, it's a lovely promenade up to the museum. You can also, you know, make a little detour to a Gothic church. I know that many Americans, usually they go either to Paris or the Côte d'Azur. Please, try to explore a little bit more. No, come on. No, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, there's a beautiful square. You can sit, have coffee, it's look over at the museum. Ponder, Cami Clodel. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you need to make that field trip really. We encourage you to, uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, you've seen, and uh, Cecile has commented on the group of the walls. So I think what, uh, there was a, there's always many challenges when we curators uh, organi uh, organize uh, exhibitions. Because of course, you know, we, we want to introduce to you a great artist in bringing as many masterpieces and artworks as we can. But we, we need also to be mindful of, uh, you know, the fragility of certain objects, the fact that sometimes they exist only in, uh, you know, in one version, and if something happens, uh, the artwork and the composition is lost forever. So it was, you know, a back and forth conversation, Emerson and I, and with our, uh, you know, general slanders to understand which artworks could, uh, could travel. It's important to remember, I think, that putting an exhibition together is not like putting a PowerPoint together. No, exactly. <laughs> for a presentation or something like that. You have um, to we're dealing with the real thing and they come with their own material, you know, it, they come in different states of existence. Um, so it, it's already incredible that that walls, what, which was created in, in, uh, in stoneware, is still preserved. No way we would put at risk this artwork to bring it here. Then there was this beautiful bust in the uh, Musée uh, Sainte-Croix in Poitiers, a very generous lander, they lent many pieces, but they couldn't lend this piece because, you know, when we uh, express our wish to, uh, to borrow some artworks, uh, we look at the artworks we curators, we consult with conservators, and then we decide if uh, the artwork is safe to travel. And uh, this uh, terracotta has some uh, light uh, cracks and you won't you don't want to put at risk these, uh, these artworks. And then you have other artworks which are also created in very special materials like, like uh, marble onyx, uh, the piece you see on the, on the right, and that one couldn't uh, travel. But go to the show, we have another artwork uh, created by uh, Camille Claudel uh, in, this, uh, in this material. So, you know, let's say that our mandate was to bring to you all as many masterpieces as we could to tease you and to show you how incredible this artist is and hopefully that will encourage you to go to the artworks we couldn't move to, uh, to you, you know, it's uh, this kind of uh, balance we needed to find. There is anyway an artwork that we really loved. I can't even remember if we requested the loan. Well, we knew that for sure it couldn't travel, but a very special artwork, and I think uh, Emerson, who included that piece in one of his essays in the catalog, is the best to discuss this piece. So, <laughs> my dear. Thank to you, you, Annalise. Um, and I, I'm just so thrilled to be here. And I don't know if, has everybody seen the show yet, or perhaps afterwards? Um, Annalise deserves all the praise in no, the no, world. Stop it's that. absolutely <laughs> magnificent. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Um, so you, you, you'll have a lot of fun afterwards um, when you head up to see it. Uh, this is a work that we both were madly in love with and um, it exists in, in just one example in plaster in the Musée Rodin. And as you can see, I think, it's compl the complexities of the composition and the material made it immediately clear to us that this was not a work um, that should really travel across the Atlantic. Um, it, it, was, it was unfortunate, but, I mean, now you know to look for it next time you're in Paris and visiting the Musée Rodin. Um, this work is about 90 centimeters high, so it's about that big. Um, it is the plaster that was first shown um, in the Paris Salon of 1893. Um, it's called Cloto. And Cloto was, in Greco-Roman mythology, the youngest of the three fates. Um, she was responsible for spinning the threads of life um, and deciding on the fates or the destinies of others. Um, I think you can immediately see, though, that regardless of the fact that this is the youngest of the fates, Claudel has decided, made the conscious decision to depict her as this ancient 
withered, emaciated, um, nude woman uh, with these extraordinary tresses of hair that sort of, you know, make their way down with such weight um, from the top of her head down to the ground, almost like gnarled tree roots. Um, and, you know, there's a sense here that, um, you know, if you think of spinning, the activity of spinning thread, you think of it as a very ordered, careful activity. Um, and here it has come completely undone, completely disordered. Now we have fate herself, Cloto ensnared in her own web of destiny. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's an utterly original and extraordinary uh, depiction of, of this figure. Now, Claudel was always very interested by different ages in life. Um, and from her very early years, this is one of the earliest works surviving by the artist, um, Old Helen, which you will see um, in the first gallery of the exhibition upstairs. Um, it's in terracotta. And it was made um, in nogent sur seine Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, you can see here, it, it depicts um, the maid in the, the Claudel household. And at that time, Claudel, you, you know, she, it, was, it was so much easier just to portray the people around you and make portraits. So Helen was clearly in the house all the time. So here she is um, making her portrait of Helen. And she's so interested by the marks of age and experience that produce this kind of expressiveness across the surface of the face. And, and you can see her sort of reveling in that here. And so to move on to Cloto is a sort of a natural advancement of that, in, that interest. Um, it's important to remember that at the same time that she's making Cloto or a little earlier, you know, Rodin, a couple of other artists were also extremely interested in depicting aged figures. And here you see his, um, she who was once the helmet maker's beautiful wife, um, based on Renaissance French poem. Um, and 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 the we think the model for that work on the left is the same model who posed for Cloto. Her name was Maria Kyra, um, Italian woman. And um, but I think you can see here immediately that there's a vast difference between Rodin's um, consideration of um, the, the, this elderly figure and Claudel's. You know, both are drawing on a sense of acute naturalism and observation of the real posed body. But then Claudel takes it to a sort of fantastical new level. It's utterly bizarre. I've never seen, I don't think of, I can't think of anything else like it in the history um, of, of, of French sculpture in the 19th century. Um, uh, I love that one critic, um, called it an osteology of an old woman. <laughs> I think referring to the, 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 the fantastic, acutely observed detail of the sort of gnarled bones of, of, of the woman. Um, and we see this figure making its way um, or evolving into um, a, an element of um, Claudel's magnum opus, um, the great single lifetime or, or cast made under Claudel's supervision, which is incredibly on view upstairs uh, for you to see the age of maturity, which interestingly is also about destiny, about the path of life. Um, and so destiny, I think, is, is a theme that sort of continues through Claudel's um, career. And so the figure at the extreme right, the elderly woman who represents old age, who is, you know, dragging away the, the middle-aged man from the kneeling, imploring youth, um, had its genesis in this figure of Cloto. Um, it's, it's, it's an incredible work, which I think has had, um, has deep resonances with the work of artists like particularly women artists like Germaine Richier in the 1950s, um, and then great, great contemporary um, women artists today, such as Kiki Smith, who wrote a marvelous essay in our catalog, which Annalise will plug to you now. <laughs> Check out the catalog. <laughs> so with Emerson, we also 
very moved by this sculpture in plaster because it's linked to a lost sculpture. Oh, I forgot the... No, you the, need to and, speak and about it's that. It's sad, but it's you need to, to speak about it. It yeah, doesn't yeah, yeah. exist. Um, <laughs> so in 1895, um, there was um, a public subscription to raise money for, um, for a tribute to the great painter Puvis de Chauvin. And, um, and it was used to commission Camille Claudel to finally carve herself the composition in marble. Can you even imagine how difficult it would be to carve this composition with all its negative space, with this almost string-like thicknesses of, um, of hair? And um, I think you could guess already the reason I suspect the reason why this work is, is, is we have no idea of its whereabouts today. Uh, I personally suspect that given its inherent fragility, it probably it was um, damaged at some point and, um, and, and thrown out probably. But, but Annalise lives in hope, so I... <laughs> well, I live in hope. Well, we should all live in hope anyway. And uh, also because, uh, you know, sometimes the end of the story uh, can be uh, very positive because... Uh, um, Anne Rivière, who is also one of, uh, uh, you know, some of the great specialists of uh, Camille Claudel when working on the sculptress in, uh, in, in the early 1980s, knew from some uh, documents in the archives that uh, uh, this uh, commission, which is the last one from the French state, dating from 19, 1907, this Niobe in, uh, in bronze, but at one point the French state gave it to um, the services of the Prefecture Maritime, so a, a French state naval, uh, naval institution, if you will, uh, in the early uh, 1930s, but no one were able to, was able to find it. And then insisting and insisting, eventually it was found in the gardens of the residence of the Admiral of that service, uh, in the middle of a pond, uh, as you can see uh, on the image of the cover of uh, Anne Rivière's uh, book, with, uh, of course, a lot of damages uh, due to the you know, calcium concretions on the artwork. But anyway, you can see it uh, beautifully restored right now in the uh, exhibition uh, pavilion. So sometimes we end of the Sometimes they story come back, they, they show yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, anyway, you were, uh, you know, highlighting how uh, Camille Claudel is an extremely uh, well-talented uh, marble uh, carver. Uh, so since we are trying to, you know, uh, give you a little bit of uh, history of the loans we, 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 we are not able to get. Uh, I wanted to highlight a little bit uh, uh, this uh, masterpiece that belongs to a, another beautiful museum you should go and visit when you are next in, in Paris. Same thing, very, uh, very close to, uh, to Paris. This um, museum is quite uh, incredible uh, by the fact that it is actually uh, uh, you know, uh, the reuse as a museum of uh, an Art Deco swimming pool built in the late 1920s, early 1930s, that was completely remodeled by the uh, architect Jean-Paul Philippon uh, as a museum and opened in, uh, in 2000. And you know, you can really see that <laughs> they kept also the, the, uh, the water. Some of the galleries on the sides are actually uh, in the showers that were used for that uh, swimming pool. You have this beautiful fountain. You can see on the, the image on the left uh, what you can see on, uh, you know, with these little passages, there, there were actually the showers that you would need to go through before going to, uh, for, uh, for a swim. Anyway, so a beautiful, um, a beautiful museum, um, which I must uh, say uh, was very uh, generous, and I need to, uh, you know, to uh, thank again Bruno Goudichon, the director of that museum, and uh, all his team, uh, another uh, Camille Claudel expert, uh, by the way, because there were generous lenses to the, uh, to the exhibition with these uh, two marvelous pieces that you can again, admire in the, uh, in the exhibition. But there was one artwork they couldn't uh, uh, lend to us, and I'll explain uh, why. I need to step back uh, to give you a little bit of the, the context of uh, the creation of that artwork. Uh, Camille Claudel used to uh, spend some time initially with Auguste Rodin in this very delightful little castle next to a major castle of the uh, uh, Loire Valley, next to uh, Azel Rideau the little castle of Lillette, the Chateau de Lillette. And then, uh, and she comes back also to that uh, little mansion by herself, and it's where she met this uh, little uh, girl, Marguerite Boyer, who was the granddaughter of the uh, person who owned the chateau. 
hence this kind of title, the little, uh, the little lady, because she was the daughter of the owner of, uh, of, uh, of the chateau. And then that little girl, can you imagine, sat for more than 60 hours, so Camille Claudel would model in clay, um, you know, her uh, likeness, <laughs> and I think she achieved a remarkable uh, likeness mm. through, uh, uh, you know, uh, the portrait bust that exists uh, in uh, the, the, the model in clay is lost, but we have versions in plaster. It was uh, cast in bronze and carved in marble in uh, four versions. And I think we should be pleased, you should be pleased, that at least you can admire three versions, these three in the exhibition upstairs. And uh, I really encourage you also to, uh, to notice and to, you know, to really uh, uh, look at these artworks from different uh, viewpoints uh, because uh, this work is compelling not only because um, Camille Claudel got, you know, a remarkable likeness of the little uh, girl, but also the power of that expression. We, d we don't know what she's thinking, this little girl, but she has a very intense gaze, demanding something, waiting for something, we don't know. But it's all childhood is actually summarized in this, uh, in this head with this, you know, softness of the cheeks of her skin. It's a, a marvelous artwork. And, um, but when you walk around uh, these uh, portraits, you can also see a very interesting feature is that uh, Camille Claudel not only was a fantastic uh, marble uh, carver, but would always do, uh, you know, differences in between the versions. And for this little bust, she always varies, um, you know, an element that from the beginning of her career, she was always attentive to, uh, to, to work on this element, hair. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that, uh, you know, the braid is, uh, different, sometimes thicker, sometimes curved, sometimes straight. It's uh, something really uh, that she um, paid a lot of attention uh, to. And so uh, among all the different marble versions, uh, one is really extraordinary because <laughs> it is you know, showing you a little bit with a lot of comparisons with what you've uh, uh, s uh, seen with uh, the images that Emerson was uh, showing of a lost uh, marble uh, statue of Clotho, this incredible crown of hair of this little girl in a web of completely, uh, you know, mad locks uh, worked tout à jour, as we say in French. So, you know, uh, with all these, uh, you know, uh, interstices in between all the locks with the air, you know, flowing around and making it breathe even uh, more. And she's presented, uh, not like the others, presented on these kind of, you know, pillows, making her a kind of reliquary mm. figure, it's very odd, it adds even more, uh, let's say, mystery to this, um, to this uh, little girl. And on top of uh, all this incredible uh, work um, that she did with a chisel in differentiating all of the locks, she wanted to achieve a certain uh, as uh, aspect of translucency on the uh, surface of the marble to such an extreme <laughs> point that she hollowed out that bust. And of course, you, you, you can't see that when the bust is displayed, uh, you know, plainly on, on, on a pedestal. But when it is presented on a source of light, when it's lit from underneath, that's what you get. And you, you can uh, hope see, thanks to these uh, images uh, with the light underneath, how thin all the walls in marble are from inside up to the neck. So something incredible, and you can imagine that that's the kind of artwork we don't want to ship it anywhere <laughs> because you don't know what could happen. It's really an incredible uh, tour de force from her. I'm showing you other, uh, you know, views just for the, you know, the pleasure of the, uh, of the eyes. So not only anyway, this artwork is too fragile to, uh, to travel, but what is also very important is that this artwork was actually the first sculpture uh, to be uh, acquired by a French museum thanks to a subscription. So there was, of course, uh, the help, uh, financial help from the state, from the county of uh, the region of uh, Roubaix, but also from the people of that city, which is a city in north of France, a very industrial, um, you know, uh, neighborhood, not uh, wealthy people. They all contributed to the acquisition of this little girl, which has become the mascot, the Mona Lisa, if you will. 
of this museum. <laughs> but truly, when you go there, you'll see the love of all the visitors of the city uh, towards this uh, little girl. And in case you don't believe me, I'm showing you here, the museum was open to the public, thanks to the remodeling of that swimming pool, in 2000. So they celebrated the anniversary, the 20th anniversary, in 2020, when I last uh, went. And of course, she was the first artwork, artwork you would see uh, in this new display they did for uh, the celebration of the 20th uh, anniversary. And so she was on that pedestal that would be uh, lit every 20 minutes. And you had plenty of people coming and, you know, nearly worshipping her. It was quite <laughs> compelling. No, truly. And they had a fantastic, I thought, uh, you know, engagement of the public with all the schools coming and doing, you know, making some drawings that then they exhibited next to it. Also artists contributing to interpretations and with a didactic panel, uh, you know, naming all the people who contributed to these artworks. And that really, uh, you know, uh, gives you a sense of how much uh, some artworks are meaningful to uh, to uh, you know, the, the people of a place where the artwork is preserved. And in case you don't believe me, Claudel is the star of Roubaix. Roubaix is a city with a lot of street art uh, uh, you know, uh, activities, uh, which is quite uh, compelling. So if you go there, don't go only to the museum, then take the tour of street art. <laughs> and you have this, uh, I hope you can see, it's a very bad photo of mine, but I, I hope you can see on the side, next to the wall, there is a car that gives you the the scale of this uh, gigantic, uh, you know, mural that is a reinterpretation of one of the most famous photographs uh, portraying uh, the young uh, artist in 1881, which is the year in which she uh, travels from northern sur seine to, um, to Paris when she's encouraged by Alfred Boucher, uh, the sculptor that, uh, uh, whom uh, Cécile uh, uh, mentioned. And um, now we want to also address another artwork in uh, Cécile's uh, collection. So. The mic is back to her. Thanks. Um, Perseus and the Gorgon is the most monumental work which Camille Claudel ever created. The marble is two meters tall, that is almost six and a half feet, and the plaster, which you see in the ancient photograph, um, may have been even taller, eight feet, nearly two and a half meters. Um, and this statue was not commissioned by the French government as monumental sculptures used to be at that time, but it was commissioned by a private patron, the Comtesse de Maigret, which you see on the left, who was one of the most important patrons for Claudel's last creation period. At the same time, uh, the contest commissioned from Claudel the bust of her son, Christian de Maigret. You see it in the middle. And both commissions seem to have been connected as the bust model wears a necklace with a medallion uh, depicting Perseus. Mm. Later, the contest commissioned are booked from Claudel other important marble works, her own bust, a fireside dream, and Vertumus and Pomona, and you can see the two last ones in the show. Um, and in this drawing, uh, the portrait of the Countess, uh, you can read an inscription, Souvenir de Sanlis, Remembering Sanlis. Sanlis was the location of the Countess castle, and the indication about a stay of the artist at the patron's home suggest how close they were to each other. Um, sorry. A photograph is missing. Oops. <laughs> OK, I come back here. Uh, Claudel exhibited the plaster model of Perseus and the Gorgon in 1899 at the Salon. And we know this plaster thanks to Simon's photograph on the left in the screen, um, taken in the artist's studio. But the plaster itself is lost. It might have disappeared at the time when the artist destroyed works that remained in her studio shortly before her internment. In 1912, she became enraged because of the death of her cousin, 
and she wrote in a letter that she had thrown, thrown into the fire all her wax models. And a few days later, having received more bad news, she writes in the same letter that she destroyed a large statue. She doesn't name it, but probably it was a plaster of Perseus. According to statements collected by doctors, Claudel, in her paranoia, preferred to destroy her artworks rather than have them stolen by Rodin's gang, according to her own words. Luckily, in the meantime, she had made a marble after this plaster model. And although the marble may have been slightly smaller than the model, it was still a monumental sculpture whose carving required a long, hard work. And as Claudel was already weakened by illness at that time, her, um, she probably no longer had the strength to carve it entirely herself, whereas carving herself the marbles um, was one of her most noticed qualities. So she entrusted Francois Pompon with this work, maybe together with other practitioners, and surely together with Claudel herself, as she wrote in several letters that she was spending days in Pompon's studio working on Perseus. You see here um, Francois Pompon on a photograph. Um, Claudel met him in Rodin's studio where he used to work, like her, as a practitioner. And he kept working on other artists' sculptures until he could earn a living with his personal works. He created mostly animal sculptures, and I'm sure you know his white pair. He also helped Claudel carve the wave and the Comtesse de Maigret's fireside dream. Um, Producing marble works was expensive. The material was expensive. Claudel had to pay the practitioner's salaries. She was perfectionist, so quite slow in elaborating her works. So she used to complain about not selling her works at a high enough price and losing money with them. Regarding Perseus, she wrote to her supporters to ask for commissions, arguing that she needed money to pay her practitioners. Otherwise, she feared that they would stop working and that her Perseus would not be a shift for the salon, whereas she put much hope in presenting this work. Anyway, it was finished in time and exhibited at the National des Beaux-Arts in 1902. But Claudel failed to fully pay Pompon, and Auguste Rodin, who still cared about helping her, paid secretly the remaining debt. So the subject of the group is taken from Greek mythology, like in most of Claudel's last works. Some important references exist in art history for the iconography, especially the Renaissance bronze by Benvenuto Cellini in Florence. The compositions of the groups are similar. Perseus is brandishing the Gorgon's head, recogn recognizable at her snake headdress, and he is trampling on the Gorgon's body as a sign of victory over her. But Claudel reduced the accessories. She only represented the shield, which Asena had polished to allow him to see the reflection of the Gorgon and fight her without looking at her directly and without being petrified by her gaze. The shield is now lost but known after a photograph published in 1902, as you see. Claudel did represent neither the winged sandals, nor the helmet, nor the sword given to Perseus by the gods. 
she focused on the anatomy of Perseus and of the Gorgon. Another aspect is typical for Claudette's last sculptures. In this group, she reused previous works, enlarging and combining them in a new composition. The body of the Gorgon is taken from coaching woman and Perseus from the dancer of the woods. Some critics and art historians noticed that the head of the Gorgon may be a self-portrait of the artist. And indeed, if you look at Simon's photograph, both faces are similar. Moreover, the Gorgon petrifies people. That is, she transforms them into sculptures, into statues. So she is a perfect representation for a sculptor. <laughs> and it is very Claudel taking over a classical myth and proposing an unexpected interpretation, like in Clotho, I think, which renews the signification of the myth. This self-portrait as a Gorgon is usually... Oh, I mixed everything. Um, it is usually considered as an early feeling or a premonition of the coming disease which was about to kill her creativity, to make her break up with her supporters, with every kind of social life, and lead her into a psychiatric hospital. Indeed, in Greek mythology, Medusa can personify paranoid delusion, which is consistent with this interpretation. As Perseus is a man who cut off the head of a female creature, we might even be tempted to consider the group as a representation of the patriarchal order stopping the ascension of a female artist. It could be, but Claudel did not see herself as a victim. She was a fighter. That's why I can hardly consider that she represented herself broken by illness. And I would like to propose another interpretation. As I took over the direction of the museum, Perseus and the Gorgon was not my favorite work, really not. <laughs> I needed months, maybe years, to appreciate it. Perseus seemed to me too thin, puny, classical in the bad sense of the word, dry. But I was intrigued. Week after week, I looked at the sculpture. I turned around it again and again. And really, you must turn around it to understand this work and see its actual subject. And I believe that the subject of the group is not Perseus, it is the Gorgon. Unexpectedly, the life is not on the side of the hero, but on the side of the dying monster. The Gorgon is not lying down like in Cellini's sculpture, but it is moving, whereas Perseus looks frozen. The main figure is not standing like, like in every group in art history before Claudel. The main figure is cut into two pieces and her body curled up at the bottom of the sculpture. Perseus' function is reduced to be highlighting the figure of Medusa. And notice that the sculpture was made for a staircase the staircase of the Comtesse de Maigret's mansion. So, for a person going upstairs and looking at the sculpture from above, the Gorgon was much more visible than today in the museum. And we know that the context of presentation meant a lot to Claudel. In 1902, 
Perseus the Gorgon was exhibited at the salon outside, and the artist tried to have it moved because she thought that the, the outdoor space was out of scale and did not highlight the work. In Greek mythology, the Gorgon is also seen as a threat to the good order of the cosmos as arranged by Zeus. And somehow, Claudel could have seen herself as questioning the institutional order, as challenging the patriarchal organization of the world of art. Wow. <laughs> so it's very hard to follow up after such a demonstration, which I think is pretty compelling, and it's just an incredible uh, artwork. But as you can see, you know, very tall, very fragile, with protruding limbs, so we couldn't have it. So uh, when we have to, uh, you know, display artworks in an exhibition, sometimes we, uh, we try to use as many uh, historic photographs. So the photo that... Um, uh, Cecile showed is actually uh, featured uh, in the ex exhibition. And uh, that gives me also the opportunity to say that anyway, that uh, monumental marble was uh, so well received by the critics and so famous that it was uh, cast in bronze by a very important friend of Claudel at the end of her career, Eugène Blo. And uh, we were lucky enough to uh, get actually this uh, uh, little bronze that you can go and admire in the uh, exhibition. So during our presentations, we've named a lot of uh, museums, and for sure, there were generous lenders to the uh, exhibition, mm -hmm. but we have also a lot of private individuals who uh, decided to really uh, support our initiative and decided to lend uh, artworks to our exhibition. And we have a very important private collector hiding among the <laughs> audience there, Lucille Audouy. I'm not sure if she understands well English, but it's thanks to Lucille that we have five marvelous artworks in the exhibition on top of loans from institutions. And uh, this little bronze is a bronze that she generously lent to her uh, show. So I want you to go and admire it in the uh, in the exhibition next to that uh, historic photograph. Because like that, you have nearly the three artworks. We, you have the bronze, you have the uh, you know, grandiose uh, model in plaster, and then we put the illustration of uh, the marble that you will go and see in Nogent-sur-Seine next time you're in, uh, you're in, uh, in, um, in Paris. So, um, well, I hope now you get a little bit of sense of what we were not able to share with you in the exhibition, and so we had to share it through uh, this uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, presentation, but you can discover really more in the show and uh, in our book. And I just um, would love to add a little uh, explanation. Of course, you know, in uh, displaying artworks in uh, in uh, in galleries like uh, the special exhibition Cap Pavilion, it takes a village. I had the privilege to work with a lot of um, you know colleagues in my institution, but also uh, external uh, people such as uh, you know the designer and the graphic designer. And um, uh, it might not be obvious because it's not written uh, anywhere in the exhibition, but the fonts that were used for all the didactics are actually uh, fonts that were uh, created by women uh, designers. So I think it's a very nice uh, touch. And uh, you might notice also this recurrent uh, you know, curve uh, a little bit everywhere. Well, it's just because when we work with designers, we give them a lot of material. And I, you know, I was sharing all the letters that we conserved uh, from Camille Claudel with also her signature. And um, it's how uh, Tanya Reback, who is the graphic designer of the show, decided to use this little feature in, of course, a, a different way. But that's the, the, you know, the behind the scenes of these little, uh, little curves that you see in the, in the, in the show. Uh, so, thank you uh, so much for uh, attending. Um, I hope you enjoyed our, uh, you know, little insights. We have time, um, I think, I'm not seeing any objections from my other colleagues over there. Uh, we have time to take some questions. Uh, we have two um, colleagues uh, available with uh, mics on the side, so please try to wait for them to give you the microphone, otherwise uh, people attending on Zoom wouldn't be able to hear your question. 
In the meantime, while you're you know, thinking about your questions, I will try to take some questions from our um, uh, audience on uh, Zoom. A lot of questions are landing onto that uh, uh, iPad. Um, well, perhaps I can answer um, the question from Janet Mandel. Janet, thanks for attending, and that's your question. I have read that Claudel was very adept at sculpting hands and feet, and that most of the hands and feet in Rodin's sculptures are by her. Is that true? We should say yes. We have a letter. <laughs> I, ca I can't say Some how many. Them, maybe not, Some, most. not maybe all of not them. All. Not all of them. <laughs> no, no, but we have a letter that yes. she sends to a, a dear friend of hers. Uh, attesting that uh, she's too busy to have her own creations uh, presented at the next uh, salon. Salon meant a kind of uh, uh, event, uh, equal uh, an exhibition, because she was entrusted by Rodin himself, who right away understood how skilled she was. She was indeed busy at uh, modeling many hands and feet. You have to imagine that at the time Rodin was uh, busy with uh, the creation of the gates of uh, hell, which is you know an enormous uh, door filled with many groups of, uh, of uh, you know, whatever kind of uh, subjects you can imagine. So of course he needed help and she was very busy at doing that. But and the, that burger, the, the burgers of Calais as well, and I the, think uh, she may have also been uh, So contributing, you know, she was working in, uh, mm -hmm. in his studio, so not all <laughs> Rodin's hands and feet, but uh, she contributed, uh, she contributed to, uh, to that. And you can see this little hand in the show, and so you can see how skilled she was at uh, representing hands. Exactly, because there is, of course, a section of the show that we, we organize the, sec the, you know, the exhibition and the, uh, and the catalog. Uh, so yeah, so by the way, uh, Emerson and I uh, you know, co-edited this catalog that you need to read. Uh, and we were lucky enough to get from all our general slanders exactly the same artworks. They accepted to lend to both venues. And we uh, you know, worked mm -hmm. wonderfully together and decided to present the artworks uh, along the sections that we had uh, agreed upon for the book. And of course, since uh, Claudel was a, a student of uh, Rhoda and then a collaborator, uh, there is a section devoted to, uh, to um, uh, Claudel in Rhoda's studio in which you can see indeed uh, a, little, uh, a little hand and uh, also uh, part of, uh, of a leg, a foot, yeah, exactly. Uh, do we have questions in the audience or are there is a gentleman down there? Thank you very much. Uh, was she a dancer? And how would, if not, how did she learn to sculpt people dancing? They were so beautiful. I don't know that she was a dancer. I, she professed to hate music, <laughs> so I, I think it's probably, uh, <laughs> that probably precluded, you know, dancing. Um, but she had models who would pose for her um, and she would direct them to pose in certain ways um, to and get the compositions that she was looking for. Yeah, and I guess that, uh, you know, artists have compelling skills. They don't need necessarily to be that character or that good at practicing a certain move to be able to represent it and model it in, uh, in sculpture, I would assume. So, but there is no, we don't have any evidence that she was, uh, she was a dancer. But uh, yeah, I think you can uh, uh, you know, look at all her artworks, there is a kind of dynamism in all her compositions. She was really uh, you know, trying to imbue all her compositions with uh, much movement. But, but at the same time, Rodin was doing sketches of dancers and was incorporating dancers within his work, so it may have been a mutual influence on them. Sure, but I must say that there are also many other uh, sculptors go to the museum, <laughs> Camille Claudel in Nogent sur Seine, in, in which you will see also other, uh, other artworks by other sculptors featuring uh, dancers. Okay, so I. Okay. Um, how, how old was Camille Claudel when she institutionalized and how long did she stay there? Was it from her death and how old was she when she died? So she was in her 40s. Late 40s. Late 40s when... She was out of Oregon for a year. <laughs> and then, yes, she spent the last 30 years of her life in the institution. She lived through two world wars, basically. 
um, in the institution, which is difficult to comprehend, I think. And where is the institution? So the first one was not that far away from Paris, but then it was in 1913. So she was born in 64, interned in 1913. But 1914 in the, is the start of the war. So many hospitals and any kind of institutions, all the patients had to be moved far away from the capital that mm, you know, was too close to the advancement of the German army. And it's how uh, her institution and, uh, was moved to the south of France, Montfavet, and it's uh, not far away from uh, Avignon. There is a map of France actually at the end of the show on purpose. <laughs> so you have a, an answer to all these questions on locations of all these cities. And then uh, she stayed in that institution until uh, her death in 1943, indeed. But in a way, so it's what is known about Camille Claudel and we understand it's you know, tragic for any human being to, to go through uh, such uh, an experience. But she didn't create when she was uh, in this uh, asylum. And I'm, you, I, I'm, um, I'm saying that because I have also a question about, uh, about uh, this. So we, we, I think, uh, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, uh, dear friends, but we can't link her, uh, you know, her uh, pathology with her artworks because we hardly know what she created shortly after uh, the delivery of the Niobids to the French state, and we are in 1908, which is also the, the year of the last exhibition organized in Paris of her artworks. She kind of, not disappears, but she, you know, she closes herself in her uh, apartment studio, and it's how then uh, the family takes the decision that uh, they need to do something for her, and the only choice at the time, there was no cure for this kind of pathology at the time. So 1908-1913, we have no evidence of mm you know, her creating artworks or whatever. Mm. And then at the moment in which she's uh, interned, then she, she was given clay. We have uh, evidence of that in the uh, archives and in letters of doctors, but she didn't want to, uh, to sculpt. So, you know, we are not doctors. <laughs> we deal with uh, the well, history of sculpture. So it's, I, I know, we know that you all know that, but it's not linked to her. It's, it's, well, it's that interesting question that comes up over and over again with certain artists whose, whose biographies are so compelling and so, you know, so out of the ordinary, you know, Van Gogh, people mm -hmm. like that. Um, and, you know, we, we, there's, there's, a, there's an, an automatic desire to really link the art and the life together. And um, I think we have to be a little careful about that um, posthumously. Um, there's also a thriving industry that I discovered when we started researching of um, psychiatrists writing essays, <laughs> posthumously diagnosing <laughs> Claudel, you know, to this day. And, you know, I think we have to be very careful about that too. It's very hard to, um, you know, make diagnosis, uh, diagnoses in the absence of the subject, <laughs> I think. Um, so t try to focus on all the masterpieces that we brought <laughs> to your uh, you know, delight in the, uh, in the exhibition. So do we have other questions in the... Uh, oh, gosh. Oh boy. Oh, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much interest. Hi, I had a question about the waltz. I think in the audio guide, it said that originally it was done uh, as nude figures and that she had to put the, the veil and the drapery on that. I was wondering if you could speak to that and also on the later, the smaller versions in the, in the different materials, it looked like the veil portion was gone and it was just uh, the dancer's dress. So if you would just elaborate on that a little bit. Who wants to uh, discuss that specifically? Okay. I will? You will? I'm happy to. Okay. I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be brief because it's, it's sort of a longish story, but I mean, she, she begins with two new Long figures. essay in the catalogue with yeah. all the documents. She <laughs> no, but really, I mean, if you want the full story, it's all yeah. in there, translated from French to English um, for all the sources. <laughs> but she, she begins with two entirely nude figures, and at that time, one of the ways of getting money or a commission to make something in bronze or marble was 
you would have a government art inspector come and look at it. They would write a report, and um, if it was if it recommended that the work be commissioned by the state, um, in most occasions, often it would be. Um, and in this case, the the state inspector who came to visit from the Ministry of Culture was utterly scandalised because the two figures were nude. Not only that. The their crotches were pressed together. Um, you know, I mean, if Rodin had done it, well, it would have been fine, I'm sure. But, it, you know, the fact that Camille Claudel had done it was, you know, it was a bit much. And so he writes this scathing report. And then, you know, Camille Claudel says, well, fine, I'll, I'll add drapery. <laughs> and so she added drapery, and then the inspector came back out to revisit the composition. And he wrote a new report, you know, praising the work and said basically, well, Mademoiselle Claudel is sufficiently veiled <laughs> the feminine form. I recommend it um, to be produced um, in, well, marble, I think she was hoping for. Yeah, marble. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, she does it in plaster and, um, and then it isn't made, it isn't commissioned in marble in the end. Um, she has one bronze version made, which you'll see in the show. Extraordinary thing, the, the version with the veils swirling up around. Um, and it doesn't seem to be very successful with purchases or so no others are cast. And, um, and then, you know, not around 1905, she, she contracts with her dealer, Eugène Bleu, to produce simplified versions in various materials. Plaster, often given to friends um, as gifts. Debussy had one. Um, and, and then bronze oh. in an addition. And then something very special at the Musée Camille Claudel. The one which we is, showed you. But which is the glazed stoneware. stoneware version in greens and blues that looks like they're literally underwater in a way. There's something oceanic about them. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, and uh, so, I'm sorry. We need to close this event. I, I see you are, uh, you know, <laughs> looking forward to asking so many other questions. So we can answer all your questions, uh, let's say, off stage. But I think we need to. Uh, we've been more than uh, an hour, and I know that my colleagues are waiting. Uh, we have also plenty of questions from the audience uh, on Zoom. Sorry, we are not answering to you, but we'll be able anyway to. Uh, you know, answer in another mean. We will have a lot of social media posts in which we can also answer questions. I would say all your answers are in the <laughs> exhibition <laughs> and in the... No, but I'm high... But wait a minute, I'm highlighting this, uh, this publication because, you know, many of the publications have been done in uh, the French language, and I know that not everyone uh, masters this uh, language. So truly, we made our best also to have all the documentation so it's not only our interpretation and essays, you know, the three of us contributed to the catalog. There is also a Clarisse over there we off which offered uh, many texts. So we try to do our best to give you really another view of all the aspects of her career and of her uh, artworks. And we give you at the end the translation from French to English of many uh, sources, letters, uh, texts of uh, art inspectors, critics, and so on. So you can also read all this material and interpret by yourself um, so many things uh, regarding uh, Claudel. But please just go and, you know, marvel at all her fantastic creations because she was truly a fantastic sculptor. Thank you all. <laughs>